Hi. This is the desktop version of OBX8, Oberheim's modern incarnation of its classic synths. The desktop doesn't have the keyboard, pitch wheels, and a few extra buttons that the keyboard version has, but both sound the same, have eight analog voices with both SEM and Curtis filters, are by timbral, and are designed around the idea of effectively reissuing Oberheim's classic synths with modern improvements. In this video, I'll take a look at it in detail, including its pros and cons compared to other synths and Oberheim's other modern synth, in particular the OV6, with multiple patch ideas along the way that explore its vintage and modern features. Before I start, a quick disclosure. I got OBX8 directly from Sequential. It cost me substantially less than retail. Despite that, they have no say over the content of this video and don't get to see it before it's published. This channel is funded mainly by viewers who subscribe to exclusive content on Patreon, including quite a few multi-sampled sounds from this synth, YouTube Premium and ads, and price check affiliate links in the description, which help the channel regardless of the product you choose to buy. Okay, let's start with an overview. Both the guts and interface of the OBX8 are designed to be as close as possible to Oberheim's classic synths, the OBX, OBXA, and OB8, with an extra bonus thrown in in the form of additional filter circuits from Oberheim's SEM. There are quite a few modern features layered on top, but the focus on fidelity is so much so that you can apparently load up data recordings of presets from the originals using a cassette. Now, I haven't tried this, but there are preset comparisons to the OB8, the OBXA and the OBX on Oberheim's channel. They go through every one of these classic presets. So you can take a listen for yourself. To me, they sound identical for the most part. Sound aside, same goes for the interface. If you're used to using one of those three vintage synths, you should feel right at home here. The OBX8 also comes with a bank of presets that utilize the more modern features in here. So there are hundreds of factory presets and in total you can overwrite them to store up to 768 of your own presets on board. So what's in the box? The OBX8 has eight analog voices and it's bi timbral so you can split up its eight voices with one patch on the left and another patch on the right or layer them. So layer two presets, one on top of the other. Since you've got eight voices in total, this effectively gives you four double voices and splits will give you four on the left and four on the right. You can't currently distribute the voices any other way, say one voice for the bass on the left and seven on the right for pads. The OBX8 also has various detuning and a very interesting vintage feature to loosen up the voices a bit. So for example, with vintage all the way down, dive bomb bass sounds very nice, but certainly different with vintage turned up which loosens up the tuning and other aspects of all eight voices. That's what I call Tom Sawyer 2.0, which along with its panning options gives a very nice and fat sound. Each voice has two multi-shape analog oscillators with various sync and cross mod options. Along with a noise generator, these are fed into the filter module. This module has multiple low pass filter types per voice and if you head on to page two, you'll see other filter options, mainly SEM, high pass, band pass, and notch filters. On the modulation side, on the panel, it has two envelopes, a main LFO and a vibrato LFO. I mentioned on panel because it has quite a few additional options in its page two menu. When you press the page two button, you get access to a long list of over 40 additional preset parameters you can edit, many of which will have a meaningful impact on the synth's sound and behavior. Now, if scrolling through a list of over 40 parameters seems tedious, it's because it is, but there are a few ways around this. First, you can jump between categories by holding page two and turning this knob, so it makes it a bit faster. But then the even quicker way to access these parameters is using the many knobs and buttons on the panel itself when you're in page two mode. This if you enable a global setting. So when you're in page two, for example, these buttons don't handle what their label says, but rather if we toggle them very quickly, 
mod to quantize, mod to envelope type, and mod to envelope to LFL speed. As you'll notice when I toggle page two off, then these LEDs will reflect what the panel says they do. And you'll notice quite a bit changes as I swap page two in and out. These additional functions aren't labeled on the panel. Obviously it would have been easier to use if they were, but less tidy. Gradually over time, you just learn by heart what the buttons do. And if not, whenever you press them, you'll just get uh, a reminder on the menu. The challenge of this page two mode is that you, or at least I sometimes forget that you're on page two and then a button or a knob doesn't do what you expect it to do. Now that I've used this synth for a couple of weeks, it happens less, but it still does. Perhaps it would have been better if the LEDs changed color or occasionally blinked when you're in page two mode. You just have to learn the hard way. By the way, the knobs also sometimes do different things. So for example, the modulation depth knob here will control noise level into the filter. These control the um, LFO envelopes, not the actual envelopes. So it takes a bit of time to learn, but typically the page two functions are somewhat related to the module that they're in. By the way, quick tip, if this business of toggling back and forth with different control functions that aren't labeled isn't for you, and you still want hands-on controls for these parameters, you can always map an external MIDI controller to them. I think all the internal parameters are mappable via MIDI, and some page two functions don't have a representation on the panel, so for example, oscillator levels don't have a page two knob, so you'd probably wanna map those parameters to an external controller anyway. Moving on with the overview, OBX8's build seems excellent and feels very solid. The desktop version weighs 9.6 pounds or 4.4 kilos, as opposed to the much heftier keyboard, which weighs 32.5 pounds or almost 15 kilos. The keyboard version is actually much bigger. Here's a photo I took of the two side by side at Superbooth. But unlike what may seem from the photo, the desktop doesn't feel cramped at all. It's just that the keyboard version is very spacious. The sound engine in both is identical and the presets will sound the same. However, the desktop is missing a few hardware controls that the keyboard has. Probably most obvious is the five octave keyboard with mono aftertouch and pitch and mod levers or levers. It might seem like the entire left hand controller box is gone here, but aside from a few buttons that have been removed and become page two menu items like the velocity and aftertouch buttons, as well as the upper and lower split assignment buttons, most of the left hand controls are still here on the top row of the panel. Even though there's no keyboard here, Oberheim still included the octave buttons which is a nice touch, especially in light of the lack of octave controls on the oscillator frequency knobs, which have quite a large range. These are also used in the hidden functions of the arpeggiator. More on that later. In terms of connectivity, the desktop is identical to the keyboard version. I like the fact that the IO is labeled here on top. It makes it easy to find what you're looking for and to also remind you that these connections exist and might be worth exploring. You've got a USB type B port for class compliant MIDI and communication with the optional third party editor and plugin. More on that later. Then you've got MIDI in, out and through and next to those four quarter inch input jacks for a sustain pedal switch, expression control for the volume and filter, and an analog clock input for syncing the arpeggiator's clock, not the LFO though, at least not in the current version. Then on the far left, you've got quarter inch left, right, and mono outputs unbalanced and a stereo headphone jack. And you really want to use this synth in stereo. You don't get separate outputs for the different timbres if you're in split or double mode. However, you can pan the different timbres lower and upper left and right. In this case, you'll lose the stereo panning of each timbre, which is a big part of this synth's appeal, I think, but then you could apply effects separately to each split or layer. A word about this particular setup, I'm using the key step here just because it fits nicely in the frame. You really wanna use this, I think, with a larger keyboard. I do recommend pairing this with a keyboard that has a built-in arpeggiator and sequencer. The arpeggiator here is really nice, but very non-standard. And I'm running MIDI from here over USB through a computer and back into here because I'm using the editor and Oberheim doesn't recommend using MIDI in both on USB and on the DIN input. They say you should use either one to avoid unexpected results. Okay, let's dive in a little bit deeper. You can always start an init patch by hitting manual and write. One of the things that I think kick up the sound of this synth a few notches is its stereo and vintage controls. So an important first tip, Patches default to being non-stereo here, I highly recommend you create your own basic or init patch and enable stereo on it. Stereo is a page two feature. There's no shortcut to it, so you just need to find it. 
And you first need to enable stereo. It starts out with mono, but you can spread out the voices which pan them randomly. Displayed gradually goes through the stereo field. Then there's ping pong. Bounces left and right. And then four left, four right is what you'll use to hard pan splits and double left and right. Once you've chosen a mode, you can then choose how extreme you want the panning to be. Full, half, and quarter. I think anywhere between half and full sounds nice. And of course, if we add an oscillator, detune it a bit, things start to open up quite nicely. And then Vintage applies cross-voice detuning. And then sounds can get really big in unison mode. I'll lower this a bit. Now oscillator detune is just for oscillator two. Vintage will increase detuning, voice detuning even more, as well as loosen up other synth parameters like envelopes. And if that's not enough, there's actually an extra detuning in here. So, Vintage will take detuning up to 63, and if you want to kick it up a notch, increase the voice detune range even further. And if that's not enough, I can detune oscillator 2 even more. This knob, by the way, controls the voice detune range in page 2, and oscillator 2 detune when you're not in page 2. It's a little odd that they chose not to show parameter values um, on the screen here when you're not in page two. Hopefully they fix that. I think that's particularly important, like I mentioned, when you change the frequency of the oscillators. Because there's a five octave range here. You can tune it by ear, obviously, but that takes a bit more time. And sometimes, at least for me, when I release the knob, it moves the semitone up or down. Speaking of vintage and detuning, the synth can get a little bit too vintage, especially when you first get it. You have to tune it a few times in different temperatures, I think, until it adjusts to your room. Luckily, tuning is a quick click away. Okay, let's dive in and take a look at the analog signal path. I'll start with the oscillators. Each of the two oscillators has four wave shapes. Triangle. Saw. Pulse with variable pulse width. You control the pulse width of both oscillators, by the way, with this one knob. And if you want to control the pulse of the individual oscillators separately, then you hold the pulse of that oscillator and turn the knob, or it's a page two function. There's PWM, of course, for both oscillators. Then the final oscillator shape is saw and pulse. Now this is a little bit different than any other synth I've seen. Pretty interesting actually, in most synths that I've tried, the saw and pulse always start high or low, but start together. So say if you take a sawtooth wave and add a pulse and you sum them up together, then you get a higher amplitude sort of angled pulse. Here it seems like the saw and pulse start on opposite sides. So when you combine them in this little diagram, the first half of the pulse pushes the saw down and the second half pushes it up. The end result, if I turn off PWM for a second, is a sound that's lower in level and an octave up when pulse width is at 50%. This creates two mini saws next to each other, effectively doubling the frequency of the core saw at a lower level. Now, as I change pulse width, this very quickly morphs to an octave lower because this is just a new sort of broken saw. And this is in that octave lower, just sort of thinner and at a lower level compared to the saw alone. 
So this opens up quite a few options. First, for better or worse, it sounds different than synths that combine the saw and the pulse together to increase the amplitude. But this opens up a few sound design options. Aside from having a different sound, you can morph between an octave up and down gradually, just by modulating the pulse with a smooth LFO. Or if you load up a square LFO, you can create trills going an octave up and down. So that's not something you see every day. One little caveat to this, the square waveform here has two modes, two page two modes. Let's look for that. Here we go, square mode. So when I toggle through these in the menu, it just seems to me like the OB8 mode is just quieter than the OBXA mode. I think that's the only difference to make the presets match up. But that little octave trick that I showed you doesn't work on the OBX modes. I guess because it's at a higher level, it offsets the saws enough so that it doesn't go exactly an octave up. Just move to OB8 mode if you want to explore the octave effect. Moving on with the oscillators, each of them has an identical frequency range. Semitone quantized of up to five octaves. I already discussed this earlier, that it's a bit hard to um, tune pitch precisely this way. If you're using the editor, then the proper values will show up there. Another quick tip, you can also assign an external controller to these and C values on the external controller. So that's it for core oscillator shapes. Then you've got a few extra cross mod features here. This button has two functions, turning on the sawtooth cross mod of oscillator two and oscillator one, pointing the filter envelope to oscillator two's pitch or doing both. Let's just start with a cross mod. I'll turn off oscillator two. So all we're hearing now is oscillator two cross modding oscillator one, but we're hearing only oscillator one. So this can get pretty chaotic, and it sounds different based on the shape of oscillator one. The pitch of both oscillators matters, of course. So not just that of oscillator two, but also oscillator one. There's no cross mod depth for this cross mod. However, I'll turn this off. There's a page two cross mod that takes the triangle wave of oscillator two and points that to oscillator one. You can control the depth of this cross mod. Here too, you can change oscillator ratios to taste to look for lovely hidden metallic harmonics. By the way, this knob in page two controls mod depth. So if you wanna change pitch, you gotta get out of page two. And let's activate a bit of cross mod, then change pitch. So a very broad timbre range here. Now this is all analog FM, so sometimes it's playable chromatically and sometimes it isn't. The ratio matters a lot. And if you find a nice frequency ratio that doesn't quite play chromatically nicely, you could always turn up oscillator two. And maybe go into page two and lower the level of oscillator one. So you still get that metallic timbre with a combination of a nice fundamental from oscillator two. Let's go back to in init patch and move on. You've got oscillator sync, oscillator one forces oscillator two to reset. So we've got to turn on oscillator two for that. This motion is quantized by semitones. So you'll want to modulate this frequency. The quick and easy way is to use the filter envelope for that. You've got to set the mod depth. This obviously takes some fine tuning. There's definitely oscillator sync in here. A quick tip for oscillator sync, obviously the filter envelope isn't the only way to modulate it. You can modulate the pitch of just oscillator two with the LFO. 
And you can also use the vibrato LFO. So if you if this LFO is doing something else, then you can point the vibrato LFO, which is called mod here, to just oscillator two. So while well, technically it's doing vibrato, This doesn't sound like vibrato at all, obviously. It's a nice deep oscillator sync sound coming from the vibrato LFO. Moving on from the oscillators, audio is fed into the mixer. I already showed you, you've got switches for oscillator one and two and level control in page two or using an external controller, you also got a noise source. Like the oscillators, this only gets a switch on the panel, but page two gives it an on panel level control. And that's pretty much it for the noise and mixer. Let's talk about the filter. This button toggles between the three low pass filter types, the discrete 12 dB per octave or two pole OBX filter, the SCM filter, without resonance, and with increasing resonance, doesn't reduce bass levels, which is a good thing. And yeah, this sounds pretty nice. That's the SEM filter. The OBX-A filter, a Curtis chip. Slightly less pronounced resonance, I think. Also 12 dB per octave. Without resonance. And with, at 100%. And the four pole filter. 24 dB per octave slope. So a much sharper slope, a rounder sound. Resonance here though isn't what you'd expect from a typical four pole filter. So it does decrease bass levels, but never uh, gets really high like on other four pole filters. None of these, by the way, self oscillate, certainly not this. So if you don't feed it sound, you won't hear anything at maximum resonance for any of the filters. So those are the low pass filters. And then like I mentioned earlier, page two, you can either look for it or just press this button. It'll take you to the three extra filter types, the SCM high pass filter. Just levels a bit. Without resonance. With resonance. So as you can see, you can use this as a bass emphasis if you want. High pass filter, and there's band pass with resonance. And then also SCM notch without resonance. Nice phasing effects when you modulate it, and with resonance. The filter has a dedicated filter envelope. This controls mod depth. And there are two envelope types. And if there's a shortcut for this, I haven't discovered it yet. Here we go. So these are rounder and the OB8 envelopes are sharper. briefly go through the different filter types with a filter envelope. So this is the SCM. OBXA, Curtis. Then finally for the filter, it has keyboard tracking. You can't play the filter technically, um, but you can either you can either have it stay at the same frequency or track the keyboard. You've got control over the extent of keyboard tracking in page two and a quick access if you just press the button, you'll get to the parameter. 
So that's pretty much it for the filter. That's also pretty much it for the envelopes. You've got an ADSR envelope that points to the filter cutoff and to the pitch of oscillator two if you want. Then a VCA envelope. Aside from the on-panel envelopes, you've got actually quite a few hidden envelopes in here. To get to know them, let's start an init patch and get to know the LFO very briefly. It's got two buses, three destinations in each. Let's go for the filter cutoff. You've got three core wave shapes on the panel and combos for a down ramp saw or up ramp saw. Anyway, you've got two additional two-stage envelopes for each of the buses, a delay and attack or delay and decay envelope for the mod depth of these buses. You can control them using page two parameters and look for them here, or just use these knobs when you're in page two mode. So for example, if I wanted this modulation to delay, there's no milliseconds here, just uh, numbers, but you sort of get a feel for it. So you can delay the LFO, and you can also bring it in gradually with a slow attack. And you can also invert this attack to a decay. So have it gradually fade out. So that's for Modbus 1. Then there's another envelope for Modbus 2. And then if you really want to spice things up, you can use the Mod 2 envelope to modulate the rate of the LFO. And for that, we need to turn it on. Then use the Mod Depth 2 knob to set the depth of this modulation. So how much you want the LFO to speed up. So a big complex. This sets how much you want the LFO to speed up. And this, how fast you want it to speed up. So to say that this is slightly hidden is an understatement, but it's there if you want it. One more hidden envelope in a place you might not expect it. As you may know, Portamento sets glide between notes. Which is a cool effect, but if we head on out to page two and go to Portamento mode, we can see that alongside the different modes, linear, exponential, equal time, there's also a bend. So essentially this is an envelope this is where you set the envelope time. And this is where you set the mod depth from negative. So bending into a note and positive. Bending down into a note. Now a cool feature here is that you can point portamento to just one of the oscillators. So there are a few things you can do with that. Tip number one, there's actually yet another envelope to modulate oscillator two, which is okay for pitch, but if it's in sync mode, we now have yet another envelope for oscillator sync. But we've already seen that before. What's brand new here is that we now have an envelope to go into oscillator one. What makes it special is that when we turn on cross mod, then we can get pitch bending effects, cross mod effects, you can get really nice percussive sounds with cross mod and a little pitch bend into oscillator one. So with that, I think I really covered all the envelopes for the OBX8. Let's talk about the LFO a little bit more. We pretty much saw what it can do on the panel. Page two has quite a few additional surprises for it. And there are slight differences in the models between these two. I won't talk about that much. There's keyboard triggering. So if you want the LFO cycle to start when you press a key. That could be very useful, especially since there's no tempo sync for the LFOs, at least not currently. Now the LFO is a global LFO, meaning you don't get an LFO per voice, but rather it impacts all the voices identically. However, there are actually two global LFOs in the LFO section, one for voices one through four, and another for voices five through eight. So let's say for example, if I have keyboard triggering on, 
I press one key, it'll trigger the LFO. I press another key. Notice they now play together, even though the timing may have been off. However, as I go to the next voice, they're still together. Notice now there's an offset. That offset or different timing applied to the first four voices, and then a new LFO kicked in, key triggered for voices five through eight. You can hear this in a more extreme way if we turn on keyboard tracking for the LFOs. So as I play a low note, and then a high note together with it, I get two different rates now because I just crossed the threshold from voices four to five through eight, but the subsequent LFO rates will adjust to the newest note pressed. If you're using splits or doubles, by the way, then things are more predictable. Each of the upper or lower layers just gets their own LFO. Then a couple of more unique or quirky LFO features. Let's maybe slow this down. So this is our current LFO moving smoothly across the frequencies. You can quantize the LFO motion to semitones. Which is an interesting effect. Let's turn quantization off. Another unique feature here, the sample and hold LFO in most synths is typically just a random LFO. Now, technically sample and hold really just listens to noise and freezes different frequencies within that noise to generate this random effect. You can feed the sample and hold a signal that's different than noise. If we go into page two, that signal would be the vibrato LFO. So now it may sound like random values, but if I slow down the vibrato LFO, it's kind of like quantization, but not limited to semitones. Rather, it's capturing the values of the vibrato LFO, freezing them, and sending them to the filter cutoff. And we'll get to the vibrato LFO in a bit, but you can choose its shape. So from triangle, we can move it to square. Basically get trills. But we already have a square LFO. It's just at a different rate than the regular LFO. We can go for saw up. And the interplay between the two LFO rates, plus where you point this, could lead to very interesting results. So there are a few extra LFO features, but I'll leave something to the manual. Let's start a new patch and talk about the vibrato LFO. It's called the mod LFO or mod on the panel and you control it by pressing the mod button and then using these parameters to control where it points and these to control its rate and depth. So we've got to point it somewhere. Let's point it to oscillator one and two. And then just increase depth and rate. So it does vibrato as expected. It goes into low audio rates, which is a cool sound. And if you want, you can also have it only when you apply aftertouch. Now on the big OBX8, you get a dedicated button for that. Over here, you've got to go into aftertouch and point it to either the filter or the LFO. LFO in this case, it's a bit misleading, is the mod LFO. So we can now apply vibrato with aftertouch. We can press hard and make it go to an extreme. By the way, the mod wheel also works for vibrato. And I think what's really cool is if we kick this up to extremely high values, um, if it's something that's always on, it can get quite annoying, but it's an interesting aftertouch effect. Now aftertouch on this keyboard doesn't have a long range, so it's a bit hard to control, but it's an interesting expressive effect. I think more usable on a keyboard with better aftertouch. Anyway, you can choose different vibrato LFO shapes. By the way, if you do want to use this for trills, so if you just get this going without aftertouch, then mod depth does tune in semitones up to, I think, half an octave. So 
a totally different use for vibrato LFO, and this frees up the regular LFO to modulate something else. Let's continue talking about expression for a bit. After touch can go, like I mentioned, either to the vibrato LFO or to the filter, and let's turn that off. Velocity can go to the amp, so the level of a patch, to the filter, or both. I think it's pretty cool that it can go just to the filter and not to velocity here. This lets you play lightly to get a closed filter sound, but it doesn't reduce its level because we're not impacting the amp. And if I press harder, it'll open up the filter at more or less the same level of a patch. So a nice way to use velocity to control timbre. Okay, let's move on and talk about the interesting hold, chord, and arpeggiator modes. Hold is a keyboard latch, but doesn't exactly work as you'd expect. It works kind of like a sustenuto pedal. So you hold a few notes and then press hold. If I leave hold now, it'll re-trigger the chord. But if I press these, hold the hold button, and then leave the chord, it'll just hold it smoothly. And now I can play on top of this. With whatever remaining voices I have. And of course, release the hold when I want. Or reprogram it to a new chord. That doesn't work as smoothly. I need to play that chord first. And then press hold again. There's dissonance as the chords overlap. And then the new chord will be held. Quick tip here, hold remembers velocity. So if I play loudly, then that'll be held. And if I play quietly, then that will be held. You can also continue latching notes as you press hold. Then there's chord mode. Let's maybe try a different patch. So the way chord mode works is you First, hold a chord, and then hit chord, and then transpose that using the keyboard. Now, unlike other synths, chord transpose is not relative to where you play the chord, but relative to, I think, C1. So start playing, it'll sound low, but don't worry about it. Then press hold, and then chord, then it will transpose properly, or at least as expected, from the first note that I played. You can always remove hold, and it will remember the chord if you press chord again. And you can hear the chord latching here. Because chord hold mode is an infinite, you can move it to key only. There's a shortcut for this by holding chord, and pressing hold. A couple of interesting things about chord mode. It's a low note priority mode, meaning that if I play on top of it, I can just play the regular sounds of the synth. If I leave the chord, then latch on to the lowest note. Luckily, you can actually create chord splits. So if I hold chord and press a split point, let's say over here, then it won't play chords above this split point. Now this isn't a split slash double split, so you still have eight voices here. So if you program a three note chord here, you've still got five other voices to play with, with the right side of the split. Then finally, there's unison. We already covered this a bit before. I did want to add, though, that first thing about unison is obviously turns the synth into a mono synth. I mentioned earlier that vintage and detune do wonders for this. If this is a bit much, then there's a page two option to reduce the number of voices in unison. 
And maybe there's a shortcut for this by hitting unison. No, there isn't. So you just got to look for it. Here we go. Unison voices. So if this is too much, you can reduce the number of unison voices. Or if you just want to play this as a mono synth with one voice, you can do that as well. So that's unison. Let's talk about the arpeggiator, which you control by moving this button into ARP mode, in which case this now controls the arpeggiator rate as opposed to the vibrato of the faux rate. And then for these four buttons, the label here on the bottom applies to the arpeggiator as opposed to the mod labeling, which applies mainly to these two. This is for the pitch bend wheel. We'll talk about that later. So this arpeggiator is certainly not your typical ARP. I guess its simplest mode is just keyboard mode where you hold a few notes, you hit arpeggiator, and it will arpeggiate these notes. And you can add notes to the pattern. You can't hold the arpeggiator with uh, a pedal plugged into your keyboard or the synth. And then there are a few playback modes, random. And then up is not up, it's order. So if I say play a C chord, it'll go up if I played in that order. But if I played in a different order, then up means playing through the order that I played. Go down that order. And there is a Stranger Things mode. Up and down through the order you played. Now the arpeggiator will let you latch or hold notes, but it doesn't work quite like other arps. The first way to latch notes is you press the hold button when keyboard is off, then you play whatever pattern it is you want to arpeggiate. And notice that it's not arpeggiating it now because I need to also press the hold button. And like before, it's better if I leave the keys before I leave the hold button so they don't re-trigger. Now what's special about this is that it will hold this and I can now play on top of that whatever I want. So it's kind of like that sustenuto mode for the arpeggiator. Now if I want to change the chord, then I need to press my new chord, then press hold again, and yeah, that's how you change chords. Not a smooth transition like on other arps. That's, I guess, the con for this arpeggiator mode. But uh, the pro is that you can play on top of that. You can also add notes to the pattern as long as you press hold. So, as long as I press hold, I can still add notes to that pattern. Once I release the button, I can only play on top. And then there's another mode here. So if, say I, let's hold this chord. If I press keyboard, then it'll hold the notes that I previously pressed, and I can now arpeggiate on top of this droned chord. So that's a, uh, I guess, second option for the arpeggiator. And then a third option is if you hold both keyboard and hold. So this is kind of like a second ARP latch mode. What it will do is latch whatever notes that I'm holding while I'm pressing hold. And then let me add notes to that pattern temporarily. So say, let's maybe go to random mode. So this mode is pretty cool, I think, especially in combination with the random function, which I think is very musical. This is probably my favorite mode for this ARP. But as they say, wait, there's more. You've got an octave transpose button. If you hold this button, notice um, that these LEDs turned off because now you've got an option of transposing between 
one to two to three to four to five octaves up. So this is zero, basically. Then first transpose an octave up, second transpose another octave up, and so on. So that's cool, but it turns out that these five transpose intervals are something that you can program to non-octave intervals. Now you do that again, I think, by transposing to C1, and then holding both mode and arpeggiate, and then let's program, say, uh, this pattern. So let's start with one note to keep this simple. Okay, one note. And since I haven't programmed any intervals, I'm just hearing that one note, but as I add more transpose intervals, then we can now hear the pattern that I programmed in. So now I'm transposing not octaves, but whatever it is that pattern that I programmed in was, and I can now transpose that pattern if I play just one note. So we go into keyboard mode. So now the arpeggiator has turned into an up to six note sequencer. But if I play more than one note, then it's gonna play those notes then transpose them, but not octaves, rather by the sequence that I programmed. And you can edit the length of the transpose pattern in real time. So I can make it longer or shorter, and then my transpose sequence will play a shorter pattern or increase it to play a longer pattern. So yet again, a very interesting and original performance mode on the OBX8. So that's an interesting function, and it gets even funkier. Let's maybe program a simpler pattern. Uh, let's say go for... So I've sequenced the three note pattern, the bass note, and two more notes. So I can transpose that. So the unexpected twist in the plot is that if I press unison, then it actually doesn't activate unison, but rather repeats notes based on the number of unison voices currently active. That's eight notes right now because unison has eight voices, but if I reduce that, then I get fewer repeats. So now basically I've got two repeats per note in the pattern. So that's one heck of a hidden feature. It's there apparently because that's how the original synths behaved. So as of the current firmware, you can't apply unison to arpeggiated patterns within the synth. Rather, it does this instead, which is cool, but obviously it would be nice if unison worked with the arpeggiator too. This is yet another reason, like I mentioned earlier, that you might want to pair this with a keyboard that has an arpeggiator and sequencer built in. Here's a patch with unison and without. So obviously you can do anything you want with an external arpeggiator. A quick tip here, if you've got the keyboard version of the OBX8 and you want a regular arpeggiator, a way around this problem is to go ahead into the globals, turn local control off. That will disconnect your keyboard from the synth, but still feed any MIDI you play out the MIDI port, then you could send that to an arpeggiator on your computer or even to a key step hidden behind your synth, then send MIDI back from your computer or from the key step into the synth and you've got a regular arpeggiator or sequencer or anything else you've got on your computer. Let's move on and talk about splits and doubles. Splits and doubles here have their own presets. Like I mentioned earlier, they don't save the patches along with the split or double. So say for example, in this split, I've got, let's go back up here. Let's turn off the arpeggiator too. Sit in motion here on the bottom one. And fifth swell on the top split. You can choose to either edit the splits separately. So just pick one and edit its parameters. And then pick the other and edit its parameters independently. You could edit both of them simultaneously if you want by pressing oh, both of these. Here we go. So this is lower sound, upper sound, 
now I'm controlling their filter in this case simultaneously. You can load up presets separately into each. You can save them separately. I've had some issues with this, but it should work generally speaking. Then if you disable both these LEDs, you're controlling the split. So all these LEDs turn off, they don't do anything. This is where you can save the split, but again, without any changes to the patches. And splits and doubles also have a few page two parameters, which you can scroll through. Balance is also controlled with this knob, balance between the splits, choose a split point, transpose either split, then choose whether the arpeggiator or the vibrato LFO apply to either split or both. Moving on, the OBX8 doesn't come with a software editor or a plugin, but there's a company called SoundTower that makes both a standalone editor and a plugin, each sold separately or as a combo with a discount. Both sync up with the synth quite nicely. So as you change patches on the synth, then you'll see that change on the editor as well. Same goes for parameters. So you'll see the changes apply pretty quickly and vice versa. So I could make changes here and they'd apply to the synth as well. If you remember the arpeggiator transpose feature, that's easier to manage through here, I think. Another benefit of the app is just naming presets. It's pretty tedious to do that uh, using these two knobs and pretty easy to do it on a computer with a keyboard. Another thing that I like about the editor, as I mentioned earlier, you can see page one, so to speak, parameter values, something you don't get on screen here. You do see that on the computer screen. And if you'd like to make your own sounds, my particular favorites here are the morph and genetics features. So I could, for example, say, pick this patch here and maybe this here and choose a morph point in between. Interestingly, it also mangles the patch name with, I guess, the characters in between. This is one that I had created earlier that marries the dive bomb bass and the basic Oberheim patch. By the way, if you head into splits or doubles, then it will show you yeah, both patches on screen at the same time, which is a very nice touch say, as opposed to only seeing one patch and toggling between the upper and lower. A few more miscellaneous items. Another cool feature, pitch bend has two amounts. So either by default two semitones or an octave, and you can actually program this secondary interval. Another important thing, I think, the knob modes are set to relative by default. Now this works like the vintage synths did. What this means is that the parameter values won't jump when you turn a knob, but rather change gradually. However, if you want a knob to reach its maximum value, you first need to turn it all the way down and then turn it all the way up. That's just how the old synths work. That's a bit confusing. I think my recommendation is to follow Van Halen and move to jump mode. There are a bunch more global parameters. I obviously won't go over all of them. I think a few of the important ones are to be aware that settings by default aren't per preset, but rather global. So say arpeggiator and chord settings that you save with the patch won't be recalled unless you move them to per preset. And then one more fun fact. Once you've created your patch masterpiece and you want to save it, if you hit global, you can preview what's in the uh, different slots just to make sure you don't overwrite something important. I think they should change the patch name here as well. But uh, yeah, find an empty slot and then you can save it. Okay, let's talk about pros and cons for the OBX8. And I think these should be split into three types of buyers. One is people looking for a synth that's as authentic as possible in reproducing the vintage sounds of Oberheim synths and would even consider buying a vintage Oberheim to get that. Then the second kind of person is someone wanting to buy a modern Oberheim and are thinking whether they should get this or an OB6. Then the third group is people looking for a great sounding polyphonic hardware synth and are considering this versus other alternatives. As for the first group, after listening to comparisons between this and a vintage OBX, XA and 8, I can't think of a single con in the sense that if you want a synth that's as close as possible to a reissue of a combination of those synths with the filters of an 8 voice SEM thrown in, this will probably cost you less and have fewer technical issues, if any. And it now comes in desktop form, so you've got a choice of a less expensive and more portable version. Plus, you get 
quite a few modern amenities and features that you couldn't get in the vintage originals. So that's an easy choice. Then for the second group of people, those of you considering the OBX8 compared to an OB6, it becomes a much tougher decision. Now, I don't have an OB6, but I listened to quite a few detailed comparison videos and to my ears, any differences in sound are immaterial compared to the other differences. Pros for the OB6 are a lower cost, more modulation options, including using an oscillator as a per voice LFO, a sub oscillator, morphing filter shapes, built in effects, and just the fact that it was designed more like a new synth as opposed to being bound to the limitations of being faithful to vintage features. On the other hand, pros for the OBX8 are eight voices instead of six. The fact that the OBX8 is bitemporal with splits and doubles, so you can play two patches instead of one at a time, though each gets only four voices. And this screen, while small, shows you parameter names, preset names, and makes it easier to add new firmware features should they choose to in the future, as opposed to the seven segment display on the OB6. So it's not an easy choice. And then as for the third type of buyer, someone looking for a great sounding polyphonic synth on the pros side, and this is obviously a matter of personal taste, the OBX8 sounds fantastic in my opinion. The oscillators and the SEM filter in particular, I think sound great. And it sounds even more special when stereo and vintage are added on top. And then with sync and basic FM and a few page two parameters, there's enough of a playground for interesting sound design. The question really is how expensive it is and how broad its range is compared to alternatives. This synth does its thing well, which is being an Oberheim synth, but there are less expensive options, both digital and analog, with a broader timbral range, built-in effects, more oscillators and sound engines, self-oscillating filters and drive. Now, all those things may not nail the goosebump-inducing Oberheim sounds in exactly the same way that this does, but they can do many other things at a fraction of the cost or get close enough to where it may not matter to you or in the mix. So I think if you're looking at this synth with a feature checklist, others will likely tick more boxes. I wouldn't recommend this as a first synth nor as a last synth. It's just a synth that does what it does really well, but at a price. Aside from its sound, it also has a few quirks that make it fun to explore. In particular, its non-standard arpeggiator and some of its page two options. You might not find the standard arp or modulation parameters that you'd expect in other synths, but you'll find quirky capabilities here that are fun to jam with and explore. Beside that, I've got a list of wish lists slash cons that may potentially be addressed in firmware updates. It would be nice to see a regular arpeggiator that works with unison mode alongside the very original existing arpeggiator. And for some reason, the sustain pedal doesn't hold the arpeggiator. I think it should. Beside that, I really think we need to see page one parameters on screen like we do for the page two parameters. It would be nice to have external clock sync for the LFO. And then a big one, splits and doubles need to store changes to presets in the split or the double, not just to reference the original presets. If I tweak a preset for a certain split or double, that change shouldn't apply to every other time that I use that preset. Now you can save these individual presets in new slots, but I think it should be easier and not a hassle just to save the split or double with the presets built in. Finally, for splits, I think it would be nice if you could control the different splits on separate MIDI channels. Currently, they're controlled on the same channel. And it would be nice if you could allocate a different number of voices per split. So you could say, play a monophonic lead or bass on one and pads on another. So that's it for the OBX8. If you'd like a taste of its sounds, you'll find plenty of multi-sampled instruments on my Patreon, along with my ever-expanding book of electronic music ideas, tips, and tricks. Hit like if this was useful. Ring the YouTube bell below if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.